positive vibes always and, and just yeah, my mindset's in a great place. There we go, bro. Good stuff, bro. Okay, so let's kick it off, guys, with um, a couple things. Um, what I would like to know from you guys is where are you seeking growth at, you know, in your business? It could even be personal, whatever, but where's an area you would like to grow in? And maybe let's get some discussion around that. Um, or is there a challenge you're having right now? Um, cause we're all in different stages, right? So what are some of your challenges or where's an area you would like to grow in? And let's just, you know, put it out there and see what we can do to kind of pick some of these things apart. Um, I'll share. So I would say, um, I would need where I want to grow in is learning how to communicate better with my clients when having the difficult conversations. Right. So, for example, like I have a FHA buyer right now qualified at 900,000. Right. But no matter how much I tell them, like where you're look the areas that you want to target, whether it's um, San Jose or even Redwood City, Dublin, you're, you're kind of out of the race when it comes to single family homes. Right. And I show them the stats, I show them the comps, you know, I'm telling them like, you know, this is where this is most likely going to land and it's where he works. He works in tech. So you would think that the data would speak for itself, but he's just like, you never know. You never know. And I'm like, man, like, even if there, I try to explain them and I've, I've, I've learned to be a little bit more blunt with him. Like, even if you both, even if we were both to two offers came in and you were neck and neck, just your down payment alone would, you know, cause us to, to lose. Right. Even I could speak, I could speak, for you as I speak you up as much as possible, talk you up to the listing agent. But as long as the listing agent on the other side knows what they're doing, they're gonna look at the proof of funds and then there's going to be a disadvantage there. Um, but I guess it's just like learning to be a better communicator with my clients um, to set the expectation, um, you know, more than just the stats speaking for themselves, I would say. Yeah, that's, that's a, that's a tough one, right? In this market, because we're all facing those challenges where you don't know what you don't know. There's a lot of unknowns. Homes are selling for prices that we don't even expect them to sell for. Um, and here's the other thing too, is that some clients, they're going to have to experience that letdown for themselves before they truly believe you, right? Like you can say it, you can show them the stats and you know, it, they're going to have to get outbid or not get their offer selected. Um, but what I like about what you're saying, the positive is that your clients at least willing to keep going and keep pushing, right? That's, that's a positive there. Instead of clients just kind of throwing up their hands and like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to stop, stop looking. So my advice to you would be to be, you know, obviously blunt with them and, and be straight up and be transparent, but maybe set like a deadline with them and say, hey, look at, I totally understand you want to try. Um, but I'm going to feel really bad if we spend all this time and I don't get you into a home. So why don't we do this? Why don't we try that strategy for like the next two properties? And if it doesn't work, then we need to switch our game plan, you know, and maybe get him to agree your client to agree to try something and then change the plan. If that doesn't work, um, you know, and then you'll know from there, right? Like, are they just completely irrational or are they, you know, Cause if you're just living on like hoping for a prayer, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Right. And then you're going to end up spinning your wheels and, and they're going to waste time. And there's eventually they get fatigued. They're going to, there's going to be some buyer fatigue and they're going to burn out. Um, I had this conversation yesterday, one of my clients who's FHA and, and uh, same concern too. It's like, you know, we know we're up against these other offers. So for me, I'm trying to go a different route. It's like, why don't we look at homes that have been sitting on the market? Maybe that were overpriced why don't we look at homes that were on the market a year or two years ago and they expired or they canceled or they pulled them off the market and go after some of those properties? Um, why don't we identify some neighborhoods and maybe I'm going to send some handwritten letters to those neighborhoods to see if I could find something um, that's not on the market, that's not getting a bunch of competition. So I would maybe incorporate some of those other strategies. And then I would also set, set that, that deadline with them of, you know, let's try it your way for these two. And then after that, you guys got to take my, my advice. 
Um, anyone else? Can anyone else speak on that? I think Enrique from the last, you know, from the last uh, Zoom that we had, the last mastermind you had, you know, we also spoke about, or you guys also spoke about just, you know, there's, there's tons of buyers out there and you're going to want to find the ones that are willing to kind of dance to your tune. And I think it's important for you to go ahead and try that strategy, what Enrique is implementing, but ultimately if they're not willing to be guided by you, then it may not be a good fit. Right. And again, it's, it's going to take some time and you're going to understand because again, you don't want to get fatigued. You don't want to get burnt out because in this market, we do have a lot of buyers, right? So we want to find buyers that are not just motivated, but they're, you know, they're qualified and they're also, you know, they have to be realistic. And, and if they're not, then we got to have that uncomfortable, hard conversation and kind of let them know, Hey, listen, if you're not willing to go this route or do it this way, then, you know, we may need to basically part ways, right? And again, I think obviously we're going to try all those other avenues first, but you cannot be afraid to let a client go, right? Because there are buyers out there that are going to be willing to work with you and take the information you're giving them and you'll be able to execute on it. Yeah. I got one thing I could probably chime in and maybe suggest as well. Um, some of the buyers that are in that kind of a price range or working with an FHA client or whatnot, you might want to talk to them about doing a 203K or rehab type of a home and start looking at homes that have been on the market longer that probably just need some cosmetic stuff that might meet their needs by going through it a different way. And sometimes, you know, you got to look past all the ugliness but once you get them to that position, they'll be able to, you know, get that home and, you know, get it fixed up and, uh, and go that route. Yeah. What's the, for you guys that are in mortgage, what's the, like, what's the loan programs right now? Can you go conventional with 3% or 5% or what's the minimum for it to be a conventional type of loan? Well, I can, yeah, you can. It depends on, on the area and product, you know, and, uh, and the client's, uh, you know, profile. So there is a uh, 3% conform, um, conforming in certain areas. And then you got to look at the loan amounts, the limits and whatnot. But uh, that is an option as well as even doing down payment assistance as conforming as well. Because a lot of times people are afraid to get an FHA loan because of what was said out there about the uh, the disclosures that they have to sign. So going conventional on uh, Cal Halfa is no different than a, a regular uh, loan. Yeah. So I think that's a good point because sometimes we may just need to think outside the box, right? And because uh, that's the thing, right? Is, is the challenge is, is there's an immediate like barrier of entry that you're trying to get over because your loan says FHA, right? And for the listing agent in their, in their mind, they think FHA means deal may not close, right? Or there's going to be challenges with the deal closing. There's just a stigma around FHA, unfortunately. But we know in the business that FHA are, can close. Like they're, you get them done all the time, right? But it's like, how do you get around that and get it, you know, get your offer even looked at, right? So we may just need to like do a different route or get them approved for both FHA and a conventional three or 5% and maybe you know, try that other route, you know, just so you at least get to the table. Sometimes you're not even getting to the table because you're FHA. And me as a listing agent, you know, we present all offers, you know, to our, our sellers, but I'm not going to lie and say, when I have 20 offers and like three of them are FHA, like we're not really giving those much weight, to be honest. Like, I mean, we're presenting them. We're saying, Hey, this is what we got, but everyone's just going to like the, the highest price and the highest down payment. Right. Like it's 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 unfortunate, but that's just the way it, it's going now when we don't have any offers on the table and we only got an FHA. And then now we're like all over that. Right. So it's just <laughs> it's just the way the market is. So we got to figure out creative ways to, to get around that. Yeah. And then on the FHA, it's extremely important for the lender to contact. I mean, on all offers, you want the lender to contact that listing agent. Right. And then you're, you're going to want to give them the confidence that, you know, you are going to close on time that you have experience with FHA um, and that your, you know, your buyer is, is strong and, you know, just kind of 
kind of vetting and just kind of pumping up even even the buyer's agent. You know, I, I worked with Enrique for the last 15 years. We've closed hundreds of, of FHA transactions. Um, you know, if you choose us, you'll, you'll definitely, you know, get some good communication. You'll definitely be able to get, um, you know, we'll be able to close on time. Just kind of just making sure they're comfortable. And then you'll, you'll see, they'll ask you questions and they'll appreciate that you actually reached out to them. Every time I reach out, or majority of the time when I reach out to a listing agent on, on you know, I, I work on the lending side, they are, they're so happy that we reached out to them first before they had to reach out to us. So, you know, again, just making sure that your lenders are definitely reaching out. And especially if it's FHA, you have to make sure that that listing agent knows who you guys are and that you're going to have that communication. I definitely think that'll, it's not going to, it'll, it'll move you a little bit further in front of that line. Right. So def definitely make sure your lenders are doing that. Awesome. Good, good advice, guys. Uh, okay, let's move on. Who else wants to uh, talk about a challenge? What sort of challenge are you having in your business? Um, what's, what's the next move for you? What's the next level? Um, this is your time to, to throw your questions out there and let's help pick these apart. I'm gonna call on someone <laughs> if you guys don't participate. Um, I'm gonna call on appraisals. Irma. Yeah. yeah. That that's go ahead, Steve. How about appraisals? That, that's what How I was gonna ask appraisals. Steve. On. So Steve, what so do you have a solution? Because I Steve, I have a lot of problems with the appraisals. They're taking a while. So do you have a solution? Or are we in the same boat? <laughs> you know, uh what I what I've done now is I've kind of um, created a you because know, you know AMC is where we feed our our uh, appraisals through and then they feed to the appraisal companies that we're signed up with. We actually have a couple companies and this is what I've been able to do is um, I, as I close deals with certain appraisers, I get their information and I pass it on to the companies we work with so they can hire them and make sure they're on their board. So that's one of the things that we've done in order to build a stronger base of appraisers with our company so got it got yeah so that's good. that's something that's been key that's worked for us uh so far you know and uh that, that's the only way we can actually control who we're actually working with without actually working with <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah good and guys and guys for those of you i guess as agents right you may be thinking like what was appraisals got to do with me right but maybe shed some light on on what this what this what the challenges are right now with appraisals guys in the lending side and how that's affecting the deals. Jason, want to go or me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, I mean, the, the challenges that we're having are my lending teams having is getting an appraiser to accept the actual order. Right. So, I mean, we're, we're getting the loan approved within four or five days. And so we get all conditions in. So within 10 to 12 days, we're, we're ready. You know, we, we have everything set. But sometimes on that 12 day, an appraiser still hasn't accepted the order. So it's just kind of sitting there and it's, it's, it's delaying and everyone gets anxious, right? The listing agent's getting anxious. The buyer's agent's getting anxious. And it's like, and I'm like, hey, listen, all the financing is in good order. You know, the client is strong. It's just, you know, it's, we're backed up on appraisals because interest rates are extremely low because of refis. And then, you know, we all obviously have these purchases. So that, that is the way it affects the agents is that, you know, we got to kind of set that expectation that it's going to take a little longer. Um, I mean, I got some of my agents here on, on this, this Zoom and they're giving me, you know, like a seven day appraisal contingency. And I'm like, hey guys, you know, I'm going to need at least 12 days, you know? <laughs> and so, but, but what I do as a lender is I'll contact, you know, I'll contact that listing agent. I'll say, hey, listen, they're all, and they'll say, Jason, you know, Mitch put a seven day appraisal contingency and i'd say you know what um i'll do everything in my power to make that happen i go but i'll be honest with you it's probably gonna take me about 12 days i go you know so so again but i will have my loan approval for you within the next four days so i will will give them you know the loan approval but then i'll let them know i may need a little bit more time and to be honest if if they're seasoned agents they're experiencing this with everyone right me and steve are you know on this call we, we're, we're experiencing it so these agents appreciate my honesty versus me trying to just, you know, 
BS them and not, you know, not tell them the truth. So again, guys, I think, you know, we want to get our offer accepted, but then also making sure that we are building that rapport where we can have that, that conversation with that, with that agent, letting them know what the true expectation is, right? On both ends, the, the listing agent and the buyer's agent. I don't know hey guys that that's a great you. that's a great segue into this point right is that you got you got to set expectations with with all parties in a transaction right to be a good agent really what you're doing is you're managing expectations right you put a contract together you promise to deliver these certain things but in our environment things are are, are changing right things are delaying things are going out of the norm so i think that's just the message to all of us here on the panel that you have to be in communication with, with the, the listing agent if you're representing the buyer or vice versa. You know, if you're a listing agent, let them know, you know, let the buyer's agent know what your clients are expecting or what they need. You know, like what I have found, you know, now doing this 18 years and, and doing this for a long time is, and being involved in a lot of transactions on both sides is that most of the time, if you just talk to people and you let them know what's going on and you stay on top of it, you could work out any issue, right? Um, and like Jason was saying, especially with seasoned agents, they already know stuff's going to go wrong. They already expect, you know, hurdles in the transaction. Uh, the challenge you have is sometimes when you're dealing with a newer agent and that's their only transaction and they're panicking, right. And you got to hold it together. That happens a lot of times, but is if you're proactive in your communication, guys, your transactions are going to go a lot smoother. Right. So I think that's just the message to anybody as, as you level up and, and take your business to the next level you have to become better at being a communicator, right? And, and, and communicating expectations to your clients and to the, the parties. And, and Enrique, the other thing too, what, what I've realized is, you know, a lot of times, you know, even newer agents were uncomfortable or uncomfortable with, you know, giving bad news or, or you know, and it's, th this is, you gotta be able to do it, right? You gotta, because again, a few things happen. Once, once you give that information that, hey, you know, I need three more days to close or whatever it may be, one, one thing mentally, it, it allows you to kind of relax. That's off your mind. Now you can focus on originating more business. And the other thing too, it's the, these, you know, the, all of the agents have been in this process before where they needed time or things have happened, right? We, we have something in our buyer presentation it has like a hundred, you know, hundred ways of turbulence, right? A hundred things that can go wrong in a, in a, in a transaction. And, and trust me, if, in every transaction, something is, is going to happen. So the biggest thing, what I would say, if you're going to be doing this at a high level is get comfortable with just giving that news, right? You, you know, it, it's, you know, the communication is going to be huge. You, you get it off, you get it off your mind. You get to go focus on originating new business or handling another another situation but just don't don't prolong giving that information just go ahead and give it move on right i think it's a really really important especially if you're a newer agent because if not you're spending your whole friday those three four hours trying to figure out in your mind how are you going to be able to present this information just just go out there and just do it right like that and now one other thing I wanted to touch on, especially with appraisals, see if you're overbidding on properties, as we all know we're doing right now, keep in mind that appraisal could come in short. And the quicker you prepare your client for that to happen and educate them on what the difference is and when they'll make it up and whatnot and really educate them, the easier it's gonna be if it does come in short to be able to just figure out a solution and close it. If not, that's where you're going to have a huge issue when it does come in scrambling to figure out what we're going to do or is the, is the seller going to reduce it? You know what? You better start because the seller probably won't reduce right now. So just keep that in mind. The more, the more you're already proactive with that, the easier that, that ending is going to become. So let's talk about that, guys. What are the solutions, right? Like, what are solutions when appraisals are coming in short and how have you guys been able to navigate that? I mean, again, just, just, on, the, just on the finance side with Steve and I, I know there's ways, you know, if your client is putting, let's say 25% down and they do come in short, we have programs where you can put 20% down 
or even 15% down. So that's where we can still leverage, or you can leverage your loan officer or your lender in that, in that situation where you know, they may not need to put the full as a down payment. They may be able to utilize those funds to cover whatever they may, may be short, right? But again, I, 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 I'll let maybe the real estate, real estate agents answer you know, some of their, their scenarios or solutions. Um, I know for me in, in a circumstance where I was helping a client in Gilroy um, and we put, a, we put an offer in and we weren't sure if the appraisal was going to come in short, but for us, the loan limit was, was capped anyways. I think we were offering like 900000 and their max loan amount was going to be like whatever the limit was, 780 or something at that time. Uh, so for us, even if the appraisal came in a little short, it was still going to come from their total down payment anyways. We just gave them like worst case scenario, like, hey, you're going to have to, you know, come in with this amount. The only challenge we would have is if the appraisal came in lower than what their loan limit was going to be, um, then they would have to totally restructure the way their loan was done. Um, I've seen those other scenarios too, where, you know, they came in with, they were going to put 20% down, appraisal came in short, they changed it to like a 15% down uh, loan program, and they used that extra 5% to cover the gap and cover the difference. Um, they're still paying the same, I guess, same price, right? The total price is the same. It's just the amount that they're able to finance and how much is down payment versus loan is changing in that scenario, right? So I think um, to back up what you guys are saying, we have to prepare people for that, you know, because that's the market right now is every home is going over asking. Um, appraisals are, are, are coming in short. You know, I've seen them come in short. Um, and here's the other thing, guys, is, this, that's, let's be on the flip side, right? Your appraisal comes in short. You're representing the buyer. You, and you're non-contingent, let's say, right? Because that's what's happening. You can still go back and try to ask the seller to lower the price. It's all negotiable, right? I've had agents do that, try to do that to me. And I've done that to other agents. We're like, we put a non-contingent offer. Appraisal came in short 40 grand. And I go back and I'm like, hey, you know, my clients didn't realize it was going to come in that short you know, can you bring the price down 20 grand, you know, cause they may not have enough money to cover the difference, you know, and for the seller, the seller was already getting like a record price anyways. So even if it was like 20 grand difference, it was still a great price. And it's like, Hey, does the seller either, you know, risk losing the, the buyer, having to start all over, put it back on the market. Hopefully they get the same amount of traction. Um, or do they just take a 20 grand hit right now and then just get the deal closed next week? Right. So that's happened to us. <laughs> and we've also been able to do that for our clients on, on the other end. Um, I had a guy on a property that me and Mauricio closed in uh, Union City where the appraisal came in short 40,000. And the buyer just, the buyer's agent called me and just asked me, Hey, do you think your seller would drop the price? And I'm like, well, you're non-contingent. Like, are you guys going to back out? He's like, no, we're not going to back out. But, you know, it, it would just help out my buyers. Do you think they would drop the price? And I was like, no, they're not going to drop the price. Sorry. <laughs> like, that was me now, like, representing my seller, right? Protecting their money. But he, he, all he was doing was just asking. He's like, hey, it doesn't hurt to ask. You know, maybe your seller might, you know, be willing to do something. I did mention it to my seller and she was willing to bring the price down five or 10 grand. But I said, Hey, you don't have to, don't worry. I already told them we're not going to, they're still moving forward. They're closing the deal anyways. All right. So just know that like everything in real estate is negotiable, right? Like if, if both parties agree, it's a deal, right? So I would be using that in my favor and trying to see if I can save my clients some money or protect your clients money. If you're on the listing side, right? All right, let's, uh, we got a little bit more time. Let's move on to a couple more topics. Um, I don't, Amy, I haven't met you, had the pleasure of meeting you before. Um, Tony or Miguel, I don't know if you guys are able to, to chime in um, or anybody else. What sort, of, uh, what sort of challenges right now do you have or what sort of questions do you have about how to grow your business or just anything you're dealing with right now? Um, Irma, I know you're brand new, so maybe questions you have about just even starting your business, right? Like you got people in here doing transactions, so utilize us. <laughs> so 
Uh, I wasn't able to Can hear you. Me? It sounds really low. I said I'm still trying to hear. Huh? Is it low? Is that better? I could barely hear you. Um, maybe the service. If you want to drop uh, in the chat, if you click on the chat, you can maybe drop your question in the chat. Maybe. Yeah, you're cutting out on my end. Um, okay. Click in the chat. Um, if you can click on the chat and just type your question into the chat and then I can go ahead and. Okay. Who else has a question out there? Oh, FHA, what is it? So that's that was her question. So what's an FHA FHA loan, guys? My lenders, we got two lenders in the house. What's FHA? So FHA will allow your, your buyer to come in with a minimum down payment of three and a half percent. It also allows your client to have a higher debt to income ratio versus like a conventional or conforming loan. Uh, there are loan limits with that three and a half percent. So here in the Bay Area, the loan limit is about eight, 822,000 and some change. Um, so it's, it's a great program for, you know, again, it's not only for first time home buyers, but it's, you know, for me, I think it's a great program for, for families where they have, you know, they have an income, but, you know, let's say they're living, you know, they're, they're paying a rent, they're paying rent and they're not able to save a large amount of down payments. This allows them to only come in with a three and a half percent and go ahead and, and purchase a property. Um, and again, those funds can be a get, those can be gift funds. So they can get a down payment for, or a gift from like a family member. Um, they can go ahead and get it from, you know, from obviously any of their retirement accounts. So it's, it's very flexible. Uh, you can also, uh, you know, you can have multiple people on, on that loan. So you can have, you know, a husband, wife, you can have your brother-in-law, your sister-in-law. So you guys can kind of collectively buy that property together. Right. So it's definitely a, a great program that allows people to come with the minimum down payment and I, I believe I mean, we can go below a 620 credit score, but ideally, you know, we would want to keep their credit score about 620. There you go. Do you have anything to add on that? I always have to find my mute button. Uh, no, I think uh, you hit it right on the nut. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically it. I mean, it's just an awesome loan to for someone who's just getting started. And even if it has a little bit of credit challenges, I mean, this program as well for them. So it's, it's definitely a, a good stepping stone. Excellent. And I know Steve and I, we, we do quite a few of these, Irma. So again, you know, if you want, you know, reach out to Steve and myself or my team, and we can definitely, uh, you know, go, go into more detail, show you how we can get the, get your clients qualified for these programs. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. All right, guys, who else has a question? What's going on in your business? What's a question you have? What's a challenge you're facing? Where do you, what area do you want to grow in? Let's unpack some of these things. Is everyone just a rock star or you're just killing it? <laughs> How about we uh, touch on a little bit of uh, what are some of the key marketing things we, we need to be doing in order to stay relevant in the, in the industry? That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, I'm going to kick some of that off. Um, something that I'm big on guys is, and, and if you guys follow me on social media, you see me doing this is just uh, video content and kind of building your, your, your personal brand and, and the message that you're trying to put out to the market. Um, for me in, in my role and what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to, you know, grow our company and uh, you know, attract, you know, business partners and also attract business that can funnel to our team. Um, the messaging I put out to social media is all around that, right? It's all around like coaching, uh, helping people with education. It's all, it's about educating people on tips for home buying, tips for home selling. Um, and I think video is extremely powerful. And I think that's, it's, it's really underutilized in, in our mark, in, uh, in our field. Um, 
if you look at social media guys, I'm sure a lot of you guys have friends who are, are real estate agents or, you know, in the, in the, in the business, most people are just posting infographics. They're posting just sold, just listed, whatever it is, right? It's, it's, it's a picture, but I want you guys to think about like, what does that picture that photo really do? Like what value does that bring the consumer and how does that method of, of marketing um, allow that person to get to know you and who you are, right? And I think this is, this is important to understand guys is that people are gonna do business with you because they like you, they trust you, they think you could do a good job, right? That's the reason they're gonna, they're gonna do business with you. It isn't because you posted a fancy photo or because you posted an infographic that had some stats on it. Uh, everyone's doing that, right? Like that's available to everyone, you know? Um, so I, I push our team. Uh, it's some, it's a conversation we have every week, more video content, more video content, more video content, more video content. It's like a broken record, right? I'm going to keep doing that forever. So they already know, like, it's just part of the game. Um, but a simple strategy guys is just once a week or twice a week, just pick a topic and post a video. The video could be one minute, two minutes long. It doesn't have to be super fancy. Just pick something that is relevant to what you're trying to do and something that would be valuable to the person receiving that message. If you're trying to help more buyers, then post stuff that buyers need to know in this market, right? Like the simple question that, that Irma asked, what's an FHA loan? That's a great video topic, right? Like a one to two minute video yeah. of like, hey guys, I'm gonna talk about the different loan programs this week. Today, I'm gonna talk about FHA. Let me give you the five bullet points on what an FHA loan is. Here you go, boom, 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 boom. Um, if you need something, give me a call, right? Tomorrow, I'm gonna to talk about conventional loans. Boom, 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 boom. If you need something, give me a call. Today, this week is loan week, right? Like educate you on loans, right? Um, and then just you get creative and you have fun and you put your own flavor to it and your own style and all that stuff. But I think the whole point is, is just get yourself in front of the camera, just post a video um, because videos last forever, right? Your infographic, it's on. I might scroll through it. I might see it. And then I forgot about your video graphic, right? But that video, like, if I was funny in that video, or I said something that inspired you or motivated you, or I made you feel a certain way, the feelings last forever, right? You, you now start to associate that person with like, man, every time that guy speaks or every time that girl speaks, she always has good stuff, you know? Like it makes people wanna come back and see more. So I would say, uh, I know this is kind of like on, the, on the, the big level, right? Like it's less graphics, less photos, more video. You know, and don't just do them in your stories. Your stories are great, but they disappear after 24 hours, right? What I would encourage you to do is post them on your feed and then share them to your stories, right? So they're on your feed. They live forever because now someone can go back and scroll and see all the videos you've been doing. And then you post it, you share them to your stories so that people can, you're basically hooking them into your feed, right? So, um, and then it's up to you guys to just get creative with what, topics you're going to you're going to come up with or how you're going to do it um, okay amy yeah. amy had some questions in the chat i was oh, go ahead. is that too long of a video one or two minute will they stay engaged great ideas for content just started my instagram now um amy there's no rules to the game right like there's no rules to how this thing is done um I would say do what's comfortable for you. If you're a great speaker and you can go on and you, and you can speak powerfully, then make it longer. It's all good. Um, but the quick one minute, two minute videos are great because people's attention span, it, it's quick, right? Like they, they're scrolling, they're looking at stuff all day. But remember, like some of my videos are six, seven minutes long, 10 minutes long, but it's a, there's a lot of stuff in that video. So there's gonna be some people who will watch the whole video. Right. There's going to some, be some people that watch the first two minutes and then they go. Don't worry about that. Right. Just just keep putting them out there. Just keep putting them out there. Mix them up. One minute, five minute, 10 minute. 
and you, you could break them down, but the whole point is consistency is the key. And um, people have, are gonna formulate an opinion of you because they see you doing it every day, not because you do one great video. Right. So it's the it's we like to think of like baseball, right? Like you win a game by getting a bunch of base hits and a, base, a bunch of doubles. It's, you're not hitting a home run every single time. Right. So base hits are your one minute quick videos like do base hits every single day. Right. And you you'll win the game. Slow and steady wins the game. Steve, what else, brother? Uh, what, what other questions do you have about marketing or things like that? No, I mean, uh, I'm just now starting to do some of that stuff as well. So uh, that's why I kind of just wanted to get some uh, key insights on that. Um, just trying to get more relevant content out there, especially the things that I do and what I've done and help so many clients in different scenarios. So, yeah, it's good stuff. You know, Steve, the the my my personal opinion is the marketing that is powerful or the message that is powerful are the ones where they're like they're actual real stories right? Like, um, and this is something I tell to, 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 to my team is that you got to be you like, don't try to be like somebody else. You sound the way you sound, you look the way you look, you talk the way you talk, you walk the way you walk, like that's what they're going to get when they see you. So it's important that you just embrace like who you are. Um, and, and you put that out there in your, in your own voice, your own words. Um, but story sell right like when you can tell a story and you can tell the good the bad the ugly and you give people that whole perspective like that makes it seem like it's real you know um there's a lot of people that only post the good stuff right look at me i just did this look at me i just did that another one sold another one sold it's like <laughs> like are you a robot like do you only win like <laughs> um you know it's like no I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned in a loss, right? Like, Hey guys, I oh, want yeah. to share a story. Like we just lost out on a property and here's why, and here's what we learned from that loss. And here's how we're going to tweak our strategy. And here's what we're going to do next time to position us to win. Right? Like there's a lot of value in the loss and what the lesson was. Um, especially like if, if, if you're buying, if you're trying to buy a home, and you're getting outbid and all you see is people posting like, oh, I just bought a house. I just got my offer accepted, offer accepted, another one, another one, another one. It's like, well, shit, well, how did you do it, right? Like, how did you, like, that's the stuff people wanna know, right? Like, how did you freaking get your offer accepted, right? How many offers did you have to write? Like, what was, you know, what, are, what were the challenges? Like, how do I like now tweak my strategy? Um, and so, don't think that some of us are more experienced than others, you know, which we're, we're in different stages of our journey, but don't think that just because you're not like a veteran or anything, you don't have value to give, right? Like stay in your lane. If you're brand new, well, don't try to talk about complicated stuff. Like just keep it real simple and basic. Right. And then as you learn more, you can elaborate. Um, here's a great tip is go on Google and search home buying, frequently asked questions, home selling, frequently asked questions, mortgage, frequently asked questions. If you just search that, you're going to get like thousand pages that pop up with questions and answers of the most commonly asked questions. There's probably 10 or 20 of them that are most common for buying, selling, or even financing. That's your video content for the whole year. Just take that Turn it into a video in your own words, with your own personality, your own style, milk it, right? Like, don't talk about, don't give them the whole enchilada, just give them a little bite on each video, right? Because now you can turn that one uh, question into five videos instead of just, you give them everything in one, right? All right, so I'm going to see videos from all you guys after this is over. <laughs> I mean, Enrique, I mean, we have a challenge with our team right now, right? We have what? We have to, our team has to do 40 videos within a week, right? So again, it, it's, it's even challenging me, guys. You know, I mean, I'm not, I am not the guy that likes to be in front of the camera. But again, this is, I got to lead by example. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm committed. I'm committed to do my videos. And, and it gets easier. It's just 
you know, again, it goes back to just doing it and, and it gets easier once you start doing, you know, once you just start just committing to actually doing that video. Uh, we, we have people on our team that are not licensed and they are doing videos and they are getting engagement and, and they are just setting themselves up to once they are licensed, they're already building that whole pipeline, that whole following. So again, you know, I like what Enrique says, it doesn't matter what experience level you're at, just share your experience, share what's going on within your day, right? Share, you know, share your wins, share, share your losses. And again, I, I'm, I'll be one of the ones that you guys can hold me accountable to doing that. And you guys will definitely be seeing some more videos from, from me, but no, good, good stuff, Enrique. Yeah, man. Um, it, it's like anything, right? You get more comfortable as you do it. I, I, I tell the story to the team. Um, if you guys have ever <laughs> looked on my YouTube channel and saw my first video that I put out, it was horrible. It was horrible because I was at that time, this was like five or six years ago when I started doing uh, videos on YouTube is I was trying to be someone that I was, that I thought I was supposed to be right. Like I saw these other agents who were top producers and how they dress and they wear a suit with the tie and all this stuff. And like, I was trying to like talk like them and dress like them. And I wasn't being me, right. I was trying to be who I thought I was supposed to be or what a realtor should look like. Um, and you could totally tell I was uncomfortable, right? And I was stiff and it wasn't real. It wasn't raw. It, it wasn't authentic. Um, and it wasn't until like I started just going down that path and doing it over and over and starting to formulate like really like how do I want to talk? Like what do, what's the message I want to do? Um, and finally one day I was like, screw it, man. I'm just going to be me. Like when you see my videos and you come and talk to me in person, like you get the same type of personality. Like not like I'm one guy on camera and one guy off camera. It's like, no, that's... That would suck for people to follow you because you're one guy on camera. And then when they meet you, you're like, you're not that person who they thought you were. That would suck, right? Like, <laughs> so it's just, a uh, got to get comfortable in your own skin and it does take time. It's a journey, but if you don't start, you'll never do it. Right. So it's, it's put yourself out there. A lot of you, a lot of people on this group right now, I've connected with you guys because of social media right? It's powerful, right? Um, Alfredo, Alfredo's on our team. He's kicking ass. Him and I met through Facebook, right? Like it's, it's so it's, it's extremely, it's extremely powerful guys. Like if you just put yourself out there, doors will open up. How are we doing on time? Uh, we got five more minutes guys, and then we're going to wrap it up. Let's get another question in. Let's answer another question and then we'll wrap this up. What's a, what's a challenge you're having right now? What's a question that you have? What's an area you want to grow in? What's something that you're doing that's working really well, right? Any of those? Um, I'll jump in to that last part, uh, Enrique. So something that is working very well is just adding to the whole social media thing. Um, basically everything you said I've already done and it really, really works. Uh, when I started off, I had no experience and now, um, my broker, she's like, you just got to tell everybody, you know, and she was telling me, text everyone, call everyone. And I was like, well, a lot of people that I know are already on Instagram. So I started just dishing out basic, you know, like uh, first time home buyers questions. I'll Google them and just post videos like that. Um, and I'm in that age group where I'm 27 right now. And a lot of people that I know, they're getting serious about their money. They're getting serious about their, their, you know, they will always, everyone wants to buy a house. So now they're like, like recently, uh, actually, after I, I joined this team, I started getting a lot of calls, a lot of messages, uh, strictly through social media. Hey man, I've been watching your stuff for the past few years. Like I've been on your stuff. I'm looking to buy a house. I'm looking to do this. So now all that stuff is starting to pay off. Um, and then to answer that question about, you know, how long it's too long for a video, it's not really about how long it is. Maybe when you first post it, someone will just scroll right through it, but it's on your page. People will go back and actually watch your stuff. Um, one thing I will say is don't, don't really worry about the views. Don't think about the likes or comments, just deliver the message. One day someone's going to be like, Hey, uh, saw so-and-so posted something, uh, you know, a few months ago. I actually want to buy a house. Let me jump on their page and it's going to be there. Um, and then like, like Enrique said, be yourself. 
be yourself, deliver your message. Um, what I do a lot, what I start off doing was I'll follow some pages that were more, uh, a lot of uh, agents or lenders that were pretty popular. And I would just watch what they did. And I will just, uh, they call it rip off and duplicate. Do my version of that. The same yeah. exact message, but coming through me now in my way. Um, but yeah, uh, I've been, uh, I've been getting a lot of uh, engagement and stuff like that through my social media, only a lot of people that I knew from high school or I just met a long time ago. Hey, been watching your stuff for a while. I want to buy a house or my uncle wants to sell his house. Reach out to him. Um, so yeah. And that's, that's just how I started when I had no experience. Um, at least I sounded like I knew what I was doing and it, it made it easier for people to trust me. So um, yeah, if, if that helps guys, that's, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. <laughs> You and I got connected through social media as well. Would you go figure, right? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, the thing is, there was going to be something else I was going to add, but um, losing it right here. But yeah, I mean, just to, to piggyback off what Mauricio was saying, like I've I've seen his his growth as well, right? It's like at first you're you know, what's that saying? Like, fake it till you make it. Like, you're just putting it out there, right? Like, you're still learning while you're putting it out there, you know? So you don't have to be the expert. Just stay in your lane. That's what, that's what I tell people, right? Like, don't go, too, don't go too off the deep end. Like, if you can't really have an intellectual conversation about that, um, you can keep it real simple, you know? So start there and then, and then expand off of that. Um, and, most of, and most of all, guys, have fun. Like, that's that's the biggest thing. Like if you're not laughing in your videos or you're not having fun or you're not like putting your own style or flavor to it, like it's not going to be genuine. It's going to be a drag for you. Right. And if it's something that you don't look forward to because you're not making it fun, then you're less likely to do it. Right. So, um, Mauricio last week, I told him like, come up with a theme or something. So he, last Friday he did free game Friday. Right. Which I thought was genius. Right. Like he took his, you know, a little saying, free game, you know, and he's doing free game Friday and he's going to do like, I don't know, Sunday service or what, whatever he wants to do. And he wants to call it like, there's no rules to the game, right? Like make it up, make it your own, and then just put it out there and, you know, people will resonate and, and connect with it, you know? So, uh, so keep going, bro. Real quick, Kike, Enrique. So one of my biggest fears is that I didn't want to sound like everyone else, right? It, it's, it's, that was my biggest fear. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna sound like that. I'm gonna sound like that real estate agent, or I'm gonna sound like like that loan officer. I'm gonna say the same thing. We're gonna have the same punchline. And and what I've realized is that we probably are gonna say the same thing, but I have a different audience, right? And I have a different way of presenting it. And certain people are gonna be attracted or gravitate towards that. So again, guys, everything has been said, everything has been done, but it hasn't been done by you right? It hasn't, your audience may not have seen it. So I think it's a great thing. Like what Mauricio is saying is you can look, you know, like Enrique and Mauricio are saying that you can go online, Google it, you can follow other people and just, you know, get those ideas and present it in your style and present it to your audience, the people that follow you. And you're going to see, you'll see that attraction. So I, I yeah. def, that was one of my biggest fears. Like, I don't want to sound like that, but it's like, you know what, you're going you're gonna to say the same thing, but you'll have your own flavor and your own audience. And if, if you don't want to sound like a salesperson, then just don't sound like a salesperson, right? Like there's a reason why Jason has a bad stigma with sounding like a salesperson because he may have experienced that with somebody else, right? Um, and we've all, everyone knows like the person where like, yeah, you could tell this guy like doesn't really care. He's just trying to sell you something, right? Like trying to sell you a, you know, uh, ice, you know, ice cream to an Eskimo or whatever, right? Like, then just don't sound like that, right? Like, just be genuine, right? And like, yeah, don't act like you know it all. Like, just come from a place of like, hey, guys, this is what I'm experiencing, you know? And if you need anything, like, I'm here to help. Hope you guys are having a great day. Like, that's, you don't have to sound like, a, like, it's a freaking commercial, right? Exactly. In fact, in fact, the, the less that you sound like it's a commercial, the more effective it's going to be because it's going to be more of a connection that you establish with people. So I'm going to end with this guys, because we're already at time is we set a challenge in our office. We had, there's about 20 of us. And our challenge was 
two videos, each person does two videos, educational videos, one or two minutes long on a certain topic where they have to actually talk to the camera. Um, that's our challenge from Tuesday till next Tuesday. Um, everyone has to do two videos. If our whole team does two videos, then we're going to take them out somewhere, you know, for not on the town or go do something fun, right? Um, paid for by, by, by the company. So I'm going to give that challenge to the rest of you guys here on this call, right? Um, if you do two videos by next week, right? When we meet again on Wednesday, two videos, one to two minutes long. Yes, you, Amy, um, two videos, right? Different topics. They got to be posted on your feed, Facebook or Instagram. You should probably post them on both. So you get more engagement. Um, I'm going to take you lunches on me, basically, right? Free lunch on me. It'd be a chance for us to connect and also give you a free lunch, right? And it'll be some something good. So that's my challenge to you guys. Um, and maybe all of us go to lunch together, right? So it, it'll be fun, right? So two videos, educational topics. They only have to be at least one minute long. They have to be on your social media. Tag me in your videos and you got lunch on me. And um, we're going to report back next Wednesday at this time to see if you did your videos. Give me a thumbs up yeah. if you're up for the challenge. I actually brought all my equipment today, man. So on, I'm <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> and guess what? Here you go. You don't need equipment, guys. All right. All you need is this. This is your equipment. This is your equipment. This camera is better than most cameras you're going to go buy out there. Just speak to the camera, right? All right, guys. So uh, I appreciate you guys coming on. Um, let's keep this conversation going. Feel free to invite people, guys, to this mastermind group. I really want to make this powerful. This is a 12-week mastermind. We're on session two. So we're going to have 10 more weeks of this, and we're going to come with different ideas every week, different people in the group, different speakers. I have guest speakers coming on who are producing at high, high levels that are going to, you'll be able to learn from different people, right? And, um, and the main thing, guys, is take this information right here that you're learning, and the way that you're going to pay me for my time is you're going to go out and put it to use. You're going to go take action on whatever you learn in this group, right? If you don't take action, then you owe me. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a great week. Appreciate you guys. Thanks, yeah. Thanks All right. Yeah. Yeah. No problem.